uh, are following iOS 9 updates and how many of you watch WWDC videos? I know he went all the way to California to watch the video in person. So anyone else? I mean, not in person. Did you watch the video, WWDC video? The, the uh, keynote? OK, one. Uh, did you watch the State of the Union? No. Uh, any other tech videos that Apple posted on their website? Just one. <laughs> okay. No worries. I've summarized uh, three or four of uh, the most important videos uh, that explain the new features of uh, three things: the platform, uh, which is uh, the, sorry, the language, which is Swift two. Uh, the development environment that you use, which is Xcode 7, and the operating system, which is iOS 9. Okay. So, I've been doing uh, a similar talk every single year. I've been, uh, I did one for iOS 6, iOS 7, iOS 8, and now iOS 9. So that's how probably some of you know me. Why is it not? Okay. We'll skip that slide for now. Uh, iOS 9. What's new in iOS 9? First and for biggest update in iOS 9 is split screen multitasking. iPads now support something called split screen multitasking. And how is it going to affect developers like you is what I'm going to talk in the next few slides. Okay. Next important update in iOS 9 is Search and deep linking. So far, you know that App Store search is shitty as hell, right? Whenever you want to download an app, say for example, you want to download Airbnb, you, you probably go to Google, search Airbnb, and then download their app, right? That's what most people do, including me, right? Uh, Apple is trying to solve this problem by integrating App Store search within Spotlight. And not just that, they don't just stop there. Uh, App Store now, uh, sorry, search APIs are now public through a framework called Core Spotlight, which means if your app is a content app, for example, if you are making Airbnb, you can index your content with Apple. So when someone search for properties in rental properties in Singapore, your app can uh, Spotlight can suggest your app to be downloaded and installed, which means uh, more visibility for your app just from Spotlight. You don't have to go to a search engine to do, do all those. Uh, but how to do SEO within this system is not clear as of now. It's too early. Okay. Sorry. This remote is not working, and just use this. App thinning. The third major update for iOS 9 is app thinning. App thinning means with more and more devices, more and more platforms, uh, you've been bundling .1x file, add 2x file, and now add 3x files, and so much, so, many, so much of resources uh, are getting bundled in your app these days, right? Especially if you're a game developer, you'll be bundling like tons and tons of resources, right? And this easily increases the download size of your app, right? Uh, as on date, App Store lets you download any app that is less than 100 MB over your wireless network. If your app is more than 100 MB, users have to wait till they connect to a Wi-Fi, right? So. Developers like us, we used to optimize so that the complete payload is within 100 MB, right? Well, no longer the case. With app thinning, you can mark certain resources as, uh, as dynamic, and you can download things on demand when users uh, go to that part of the screen. It's very uh, useful for level-based level games. Like, for example, I have a game from level one to level 50. I can just bundle level one inside the game and mark level two to level 50 as dynamic through resource tags. And download level two 
only after the after the user has completed level one. This means you can kind of reduce your app download initial download size. Okay, there's more to app thinning. We'll talk about it later. CloudKit, iCloud Sync was kind of broken, right? So Apple introduced CloudKit in iOS eight, and they had a easy way to migrate from iCloud Sync to CloudKit, right? How many of you have used CloudKit in your app? Probably no one. Okay. Uh, how many of you have used Parse? Some of you? No one? Yeah, one. Uh, Parse had an advantage over CloudKit in a, in a way that uh, the data you store in Parse can be used and accessed from other application, uh, sorry, other platforms like Android, web, right? CloudKit was almost like locked into Apple platform, right? With iOS 9, uh, Apple is opening up, and uh, you have a cloudkit.js JavaScript library that lets you access your CloudKit data store from a web application. There is also a CloudKit web service API, a HTTP API, with which you can write your own CloudKit client for Android or Windows Phone or whatever. Okay? So data you store in CloudKit is no longer locked into one single platform. News publisher. Another thing that is new, how many of you are content producers? How many of you write blogs, maintain blogs? No one? Or is it like no one, or is it like no one wants to raise their hands? I'm not going to ask you questions over it. Okay? So news publisher is a way, uh, is very, very similar to Flipboard. Uh, the advantage, it's baked right into your uh, operating system. And uh, you can sign up as a publisher with Apple by just providing your RSS feed as of now. Uh, Apple is coming up with something called Apple Format News, with which you can change the layout, change the way the news articles get animated, and so on. Not much information is available as on date. When months pass by, when a couple of months pass by, you'll probably have more info here. Lastly, and most interesting one is content blocker extension. Okay. Uh, most of the content blocker extension, even, even, even uh, Adblock, Adblock Plus, they all work not by blocking loads, but by removing divs after they load. Very few, like unless you install a VPN-based ext extension, they don't block loading. They only remove your divs so that you don't see them. Okay, that's how Adblock work for the most part. But with content blocking extensions in Safari, you can prevent uh, certain URLs from certain domains and subdomains from loading completely, which means uh, you can have an ad-free experience, not just in Safari, but also in Facebook, Twitter, and every other app that uses Safari to display web pages. OK? And writing a content blocker extension is fairly straightforward. You know why? Xcode has a built-in uh, template. Click content blocker extension, next, 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 you get a template. Just provide what all needs to be done, you get it. Okay? So a brief history about iOS. iOS uh, Apple usually alternates between a user-focused release and a developer-focused release. This has been happening since iOS 1. iOS 1. We didn't have access to an SDK, right? It was a purely a user-focused release. iOS 2, not much on the UI side. Mostly uh, a developer release. They released an SDK. They, they had an app store. They let users, uh, sorry, they let developers submit apps and uh, get paid for their work, so, so on. iOS 3, user-focused release. Cut, copy, paste. Most important feature of iOS 4, right? Sorry, iOS 3 iOS 4, again, developer focus release, not much on UI. I forgot what was introduced. iOS 5 was user focus release. Uh, I think push notification was introduced in iOS 5. They targeted iOS 4 and then released it in iOS 5, if I'm not wrong. iOS 6 was, again, developer focus released. iOS 7 was mixed. It was both for users and developers. Users got a uh, fairly new UI, and developers had tons and tons of work just to get your app look nice on the iOS 7 new user interface. iOS 8 was a user-focused release, not much changes. iOS 9, 
is performance related tweaks uh, and it's a developer focused release, which means iOS 9 uh, means you have a lot of work to do for changing, your, for migrating your app to support iOS 9. And we have a whole new font called San Francisco. This slide uses San Francisco. Okay, so that's how you know that we have a new font. Uh, there, are, there are two kind, two variants: San Francisco Display and San Francisco Text. Uh, the display one is used for text sizes about 20, 20 points, and you don't have to change your fonts. It, it automatically uh, happens. Like if you if you create a font that is less than 20 pixels, it, sorry, 20 points, it automatically changes to San Francisco text. And if it is more than uh, 20, it changes to San Francisco display. Okay? And for watch, you have an equivalent set called San Francisco compact display and text. And I don't know the point size when it triggers, when it changes from text to display. And this is the cool thing about it. And the, the, the difference between display and text is it's, uh, it makes text readable at any point size. Okay? This is a feature that jailbroken iPads were, have, uh, were having since I was four or five, right? How many of you have jailbro jailbroken your iPads? Some of you might have done, right? And again, you don't want to. Show your hands, right? Uh, so, what is so special about split screen multitasking is after a very long time, Apple allows two applications to run simultaneously on one single screen. Okay? And what implication that has on you as a developer is what we are going to see. There are three kinds of uh, multitasking that is, allowed, that is supported on iOS, iOS 9. One is called a slide over. The other is called a split view. The last one is picture in picture, also known as PIP. Okay. Slide over multitasking. What is it? What is slide over? Slide over is uh, when I have an iPad. Of course, this is not running iOS seven. I have an app like this. When I slide it, slide my finger over from the left, I see a task a picker from which I can select the second app that I want to run. Okay. Split view is an extension of slide over. You can make that single app run simultaneously using a split screen. So what is the difference between slide over and split view? In slide over, your main parent, uh, main app just becomes inactive. It doesn't run. You see what is happening on, you see the screen, but it doesn't run. You can quickly open Twitter, send a tweet, and then go back to your parent app. Like say for example, your, your uh, browsing something on Safari. Just want to send a quick tweet. You don't have to close your application, open Twitter, send a tweet, and then come back to Safari. You can just pick an uh, app, slide it over, and then work on it, and then just close it. Okay? With Split View, you can have two apps running at the same time. Okay? Picture in Picture is mostly for applications that display videos, like YouTube, Daily Motion kind of apps. So what happens when a user slides over your application in iOS 9? Even if your application is an iPad designed application, when, you're, when your application is uh, slide over on iOS 9, what happens is your application uh, is executed as if it's an iPhone application within the right edges of the screen. OK? Unfortunately, I don't have screenshots because I'm not allowed to post screenshots. Okay, I can show you some from the internet. Go and search. <laughs> okay, it's too early, and it's uh, no one is allowed to post screenshots, and my slides are going to be boring because of that. Okay, so what you as a developer should understand is many of us have written code by checking the device orientation. Right? If device orientation is landscape, do something. If device orientation is portrait, do something. Right? How many of you have done that? I've done it. No one? Okay. <laughs> right? Uh, this kind of code is going to break. 
Why? Because even if my application, uh, so, sorry, even if my iPad is in landscape, when an application is, uh, when, when the user slides over another application, that app takes uh, a portrait orientation on the right edge of the screen. Okay, so the layout of that app is portrait, though your device orientation is landscape. Which means whatever you do, whatever code you write within uh, a if condition that says if device orientation is something, do something, it's all going to break. You're not, you, you shouldn't use device orientation anymore. And what should you use instead? Size classes. Size classes was in introduced in, in iOS 8 last year, which provides a more elegant way to do what you have to do. How many of you use UI window, main window, bounds? Right? Again, we all assumed that your app is going to be always full screen. And my app's main window size is what my view controller, my, my parent view controller size, right? Not anymore. You, you, with, with split screen multitasking, your application's main window uh, might be considerably smaller than the device's main window. It, can, it could run on a smaller window. So code that uses window size to position things, to position your subviews are going to break. Again, use size classes. This has been, uh, Apple has been recommending us to use interface idioms since iOS 3.2, right? When Apple introduced iPad, they said, okay, you can use a macro called UI interface idiom. It returns iPad on an iPad. It returns iPhone on an iPhone, right? So we had code that said, uh, if UI interface idiom equal to iPad, do something. If it is iPhone, do something. Not going to work. Because I can slide over Twitter as an iPhone app inside my iPad. So all those kind of code is going to break. Again, Apple's recommendation, use size classes. Size classes is completely new. It came just last year. You will have to migrate your code to use auto layout and size classes. No other option. And memory. Most of the old devices, uh, we'll come back to consideration. There's one, uh, one slide just dedicated for consideration. You will have to consider about memory usage within your app, CPU cycle usages, uh, CPU cycles used within your app, and the frame rate that you aim for in your app. We, we all know that 60 frames offer that butter smooth scrolling, right? 60 frames boils down to 16.66 millisecond per frame, right? That's all going to break because you now have two or three applications at the same time on the, on the screen. So all these three apps together should render everything in 16.66 milliseconds, which means what you have is less than 16.66 milliseconds. We'll come back to uh, the consideration in a short while. Split view on pow uh, is uh, enabled only on powerful de devices. All devices will support slide over, but to make it a split view application with both apps running, uh, you need iPad Air 2 and higher devices. Higher, we don't know what's new, right? The size can vary based on uh, the divider's position. No arbitrary sizing. You, you cannot size your divider any way you want. Three-fourths, half, and one-fourth are the three possible sizes. And size glass will let you know what exactly is the size chosen by the user. Regular, compact, or uh, what is the other one? Full, something. Picture in picture, probably the easiest uh, multitasking enhancement that you can adopt. As long as you're not using MP movie player controller, you're good. Okay. Uh, Apple introduced something called AV player controller or something similar to something that starts with AV, AV player controller or something like that in iOS 7 or iOS 8. If you use that to playback video, uh, enabling PIP is just saying allow picture in picture, something like that. Yes, that's all. And it just works. But if you're using MP Movie Player Controller, you will have to change your code to use AV Player Controller because MP Movie Player Controller is deprecated in iOS 9. Okay? They're going to remove this probably soon and force you to you know, support picture in picture. Okay? The other important consideration that you have to uh, 
uh, understand when you use picture in picture is when an external screen is connected to your device when your application is displaying a PIP. So what happens is when an external device is connected, if your application supports secondary screen, your PIP photo video is going to automatically move to another screen and users will not know what is happening. This happens when users toggle the airplay from the control center. So there are some uh, notifications and delegate methods that are called back on your view controller that which you have to handle. Okay. Yeah, it's called as AV player view controller. If your uh, if your application is displaying a full screen video using AV player controller, you don't have to do anything. When the user closes the app by using by pressing the home button or when he launches another app, PIP automatically kicks in. If it is not full screen, it doesn't. And uh, you should not, as a developer, you should not automatically display a PIP when you're disp when you're playing back a video in a sub view without user explicitly asking you to display it if you do so you'll be re your app will be rejected okay so so far for the last 7 8 years this has been the motto of good ios applications use as much memory as you can when you are in the foreground and use as much cpu cycles you can when you are in the foreground and relinquish everything when you go back you can you, you you are free to use like on a on a 1 gb ipad you are free to use up to like 700 or 750 mb in working memory just for your application but with ios 9 it all boils down boils back to how windows and macintosh managed memory be a good citizen on uh, on an operating system that you are running on use as little memory as possible so this is going to uh, considerably change how you cache things, how you store certain things within your application. Okay. This doesn't stand true anymore. Why? Because if your application takes up all, the, all available memory, when a secondary app, app is opened inside of a split view, it will not have enough memory. And to uh, allow that app to run, your app might get killed. And that's a bad user experience, right? So you don't have the liberty to use as much memory as possible anymore on iOS 9. Profile your application. So far, this wasn't that important. Only when you're scrolling table views, only when you're scrolling the most important table view in your class, you used to use instruments to profile your application, right? But not true anymore. Again, uh, what we normally do is we aim for 60 frames per second when user scrolls through, through their application, right? when the user scrolls a table view in your application, right? Uh, and that boils down to a, a render time of 16.66 millisecond per frame. So if you have a table view that is displaying, say, 10 or 15 cells at one go, you have about 1.2, 1.3 milliseconds to, to render one single cell, right? This is no longer true with, with the new multitasking because I can have two different apps scrolling at the same time, with another app displaying a PIP video screen. And all this have to render within the, uh, within the 16.66 milliseconds, which means you are now left with less than a millisecond to display, uh, sorry, less than probably half of it, like six or seven milliseconds to display your uh, frame. That means your job is going to be even more complicated getting the performance, getting the right kind of performance is going to, going to be even more complicated with the new multitasking uh, in iOS 9. Okay. Lastly, again, as I said, use size classes instead of device orientation or instead of, uh, or instead of using main window bounds. This code will not work anymore. I mean, it still works, but your, but your layout is going to look messy. Again, this is another one. A easy way to opt, uh, a, a easy way to get uh, rid of this situation is by just opting out of multitasking. At least for first three months, you can do this. Okay, uh, that is done by using a key called UI needs full screen equal to yes in your info p list. It's just a checkbox that you have to check, and automatically adds that key. But don't do it. 
uh, Apple's recommended uh, applications, Apple's recommended list of applications that can opt out of multitasking is this. Games that use full screen sensors, full screen uh, games that use iPad sensors. Like if I'm using the accelerometer of, a, of the iPad to play my game, it doesn't make sense uh, when another application sits halfway uh, onto the screen, right? So if, you, if, you, if your game is like that, then yes. Makes sense. Don't you can you can opt out of multitasking. Camera applications, uh, anything that triggers the iPad's camera, obviously have to be in full screen. Kiosk mode applications like uh, point of sale uh, apps or ATM machines. For for those kind of kiosks, yes, you can opt out from multitasking. That's it about multitasking. Multitasking is easily one of the biggest uh, update in uh, iOS 9, and it's easy for the user, super difficult for us. Huh? La uh, next one is search and deep linking. Apps can be discovered with uh, Spotlight. I can just pull Spotlight, uh, start searching for something like uh, bruised knee. My knee is bruised. I want to know what apps will offer me suggestions. So App Store or Spotlight automatically recommends that I download WebMD so that I can know what I should do for uh, if my knee is bruised. If I'm searching something for a uh, spare part for my car, whatever, uh, App Store will uh, ask you to download an app that can help you do something. All this without opening uh, your browser. And that means your application should, uh, very similar to what we did with meta tags in HTML, your application should uh, hint Apple that you can do this, you can do this, etc. And what keywords you uh, submit to Apple is very, it's, it's a complete black box. And th there are going to be SEO guys who can help you with this uh, in the future. At least for the first six months, we probably won't understand how Apple uh, is indexing, how Apple is doing all this search and deep linking stuff. But yeah, someone will figure it out. It's, it's a very great technique for content apps. Right now, we have, uh, uh, for, for searching for any content, you open your browser, go to Google, search for something, and then download the app, and then again search, the same, search for the same stuff inside the app, right? And mostly no one does that. If this works as advertised, it's going to be very, very useful for content producers. This, uh, the framework that you have to uh, uh, look for is Core Spotlight. Core Spotlight was, uh, was a Mac framework that lets you index so that Spotlight search on Mac can index your files, your files within your application. But it's now expanded to iOS. And if you are a content app, if you are like a reminder app, uh, you can use the same core Spotlight so that uh, Spotlight search knows about the reminders created inside of your app. Or if you are a notes application, you can use core Spotlight to say that these are all the notes I uh, have. And so when the user searches for something, you can, you can show a result. Uh, when the user taps on that result, your app opens with that reminder. Okay. Right now, when you search for something in Spotlight, you are able to launch messages, calendar, and Apple's reminder. Right? Because the API is public now, you you can index your own data inside of course Spotlight. Okay. It's used in conjunction with something called NS User Activity that was launched uh, last year for something called Continuity. App thinning, uh, as I explained before, with multiple devices, multiple screen resolutions, and multiple uh, uh, densities of screens, like Retina, Retina 2, uh, at 1x, at 2x, and now we have at 3x with iPhone 6 Plus. It's getting complex to create all these assets, and it's getting you, your application bundle is getting heavier and heavier, right? With app thinning you can significantly make the app smaller, at least the initial download smaller. Okay? And the best part is if you ship at 1x, 2x, and 3x images, 
App Store will take care of downloading just the 3x images if your app is being downloaded on an iPhone 6 Plus. If your app is being downloaded on an iPhone 4 or iPhone, okay, for, uh, or maybe an iPad 2, uh, App Store downloads just the 1x images, which means your initial app download is going to be significantly lower. Okay. You can also mark certain assets as on-demand resources, like as I explained before, uh, if you are a level-based game, I can mark level 2 to level 50 as uh, on-demand resource and download these resources uh, on-demand whenever I want. Like As soon as the user finishes level 1, I can initiate a download to, do to download all the assets for level 2. Okay? This way, you can reduce the initial download size of your application. And when I say resource, it doesn't have to be PNG files. It can be anything. It can be a storybook. It can be chap the fifth chapter inside a storybook. Anything. Anything that you put inside a resource bundle, that's all. Okay? And when I say download from App Store, you are going to download it from App Store programmatically, not the user. Okay? Yeah, the main uh, reason is it significantly reduces the initial download size of your application. A very Im interesting stuff is App Transport Security, which mandates uh, that every URL connection you make is a HTTPS connection. Uh, so if you don't add an exclusion and try to call uh, HTTP colon slash slash google.com using a NS URL session or something, iOS 9 will automatically redirect that request to HTTPS colon slash slash. All requests are now converted automatically to HTTPS, even if you make a mistake. But if your server doesn't support HTTPS, you can give an ex you can create an exception inside InfoPList, and that exception is NS temporary third-party exception allow insecure HTTP loads. If you set this to yes for a given domain, that domain. Uh, that domain HTTP calls will go through. But I believe that in future, this will probably be deprecated and uh, Apple is going to force you to use HTTPS for everything. Because packet sniffing, privacy is getting common these days, right? Privacy issues and uh, Apple want to thwart all those uh, problems that users are facing. So everything will automatically be translated to HTTPS. If you have the control over your backend server, implement SSL now. At least start planning to implement SSL now. If you don't have control over uh, your backend server, you can use an exception for the time being. Okay? Yeah, exception can be on a per domain basis or it can be per pervasive. Yeah. I'm expecting more changes to uh, app transport security with uh, iOS 10 and what the future holds. CloudKit, this is interesting. Apple has uh, opened up the data you store in CloudKit, and you can now access those data using CloudKit JS. It's a JavaScript library. So if you're writing a web application, you can display the same data that your users store from your application. Like, for example, if I'm making a reminder application, I can have a website that displays the same reminders. Previously, this was not possible with iCloud stored data, right? You are using parse or third party data storage, all those stuff. Don't have to do it anymore. Okay? So, CloudKit.js, you, you, you also have a web service API based on HTTP so that you can access the same data that you store from your iPhone through cloud, to CloudKit on another device running on a completely different platform, like say Android or Windows Phone, whatever. Okay? News publisher, as of now, not many info, info, information is available, uh, but any, any website that supports RSS feeds can be added right away. Okay? And uh, there is something new called Apple News Format. Uh, it's still unknown. No documentation is available from Apple as of now. They're still working on it, probably. Content blocker extension, interesting stuff. 
can now write a Safari extension right from Xcode with a default template and create an ad block. Okay. Most ad blocks work by just hiding divs. So your uh, bandwidth is actually wasted to download your advertisements. Not anymore with uh, Safari this thing. It just passes you the URL of a subdomain and asks you, should I load, should I load, should I load, and I delegate this all. Works not only in Safari, but also in SF Safari View Controller, which is a new uh, replacement for UI Web View or WK Web View. And even that will not display uh, contents blocked by your extension. Okay. So that's all the most important new features in iOS 9. Any questions so far? I'm going to move to the next important uh, part of the discussion, which is Swift 2. What is new in Swift 2? How many of you have used Swift before? I know that the presenter was, disp was presenting everything in Swift. So apart from that, OK, one, two, OK, not bad. At least some hands go up. Uh, I did not use Swift 1. The reason is, when Swift 1 was announced, Apple said, we are not going to be, uh, we are not going to have a backward compatibility when Swift 2 is released. That pissed me off. Why should I invest time today, learn something new, only for Apple to change it next year, right? Like, for example, if you have uh, written some application in Swift 1, if you compile it today with Xcode 7, it's not going to work. You'll not get like one or two errors. You'll get like tons and tons of errors, like hundreds and 200, like hundreds of errors, OK? And there is no easy way to migrate your application from Swift 1 to Swift 2. But if you have uh, written applications using Swift 1.2, which was released in March or April this year, six, four, three, four months ago, there is a migrator that can convert 1.2 to Swift 2. OK? Uh, even today, Apple stands is like when Swift 3 is uh, released, it will not be backward compatible with your Swift 2 code. OK? It, it's code wise backward compatibility. OK? There's no code wise backward compatibility, but there is binary backward compatibility, which means if you release an app that uh, was written using Swift 1, it continues to run even on iOS 21. Because Swift actually ships. Uh, a small Swift runtime along with your application. So your app will continue to run, but your code will not run. And you will not have Xcode 5 that can interpret your code so that you can submit your app again. Okay? So it, your app will run. It's binary backward compatible, but not code compatible. Okay? But with, Xcode, with Swift 2, Apple uh, has released a migrator, which means they are going to release a migrator when Swift 3 is launched as well. Okay, there's a migrator now for that migrates your code from Swift 1.2 to 2. I think the code that was used in one of your, who, where is the presenter? Uh, the previous uh, presenter was using Swift 1.2, right? Yeah, there is a migrator that lets you migrate your code from Swift 1.2 to 2 easily. Okay. There's a new statement called God. Uh, Quite difficult to explain God. Let, let me try uh, to explain what God statement is. God is a way to use uh, to to return from a function earlier. Like for example, uh, let's say that you are writing a function that does something, and this function uh, expects two or three mandatory parameters. And if these parameters are missing, you cannot function anymore. So what you normally do? If username equal to equal to nil, return. If password equal to equal to nil, return. Else do something, right? God is a new keyword that lets you uh, bail out of a function earlier without using a if statement. Okay? Because Swift adopts all this functional programming paradigm, they hate looping and if conditions. Right? So God is one that lets you avoid using if when you are not really checking for a condition. Error handling with uh, Swift uh, uses a new syntax, slightly different from Java or uh, any other uh, error handling that you have seen. 
it's do try catch it's not try catch finally it's do try catch okay and because error handling now uses a keyword called do the previously used do keyword the do while loop is now changed to repeat while okay uh testability annotations you can now mark this very important how many of you write unit test cases i don't okay one two okay when you write unit test cases you will have a problem where like in java probably if you have written unit test cases in java you will pro probably mark every single function as public so that your unit test case suite can access those methods right but with swift 2 you have a class called at testable so you can import a package uh, uh, you can import a namespace or you, you can import a complete class uh, using at testable keyword that marks that converts all internal classes to public just for the testing suite so your test testing suite can see all your private methods and you can write test cases for all your private methods without exposing them to public okay availability checking there's a new API which we'll look at it in a short while. And then finally, protocol extensions. Protocol extensions, uh, previously when you had to add features to one of your classes, you used categories in Objective-C, right? Protocol extensions let you create protocols that extend a, a functionality of a given struct or a class, okay? First thing, migrator, because there is a migrator, you can now use Swift 2 in your production code. How many of you have uh, written, used Swift in your production code? Have you used it? No. I'm going <laughs> to tell your boss. <laughs> okay, Swift 2 is not like that. Swift 2, you can use it in production uh, because there's a migrator, which means when uh, next year when Apple releases Swift 3, you still, your code is not completely lost. You can still migrate it to Swift 3. It's not like you have to rewrite everything from scratch, like what happened with Swift 1, okay? Error handling. Very interesting pattern. Uh, a, a quick and dirty uh, code that uh, illustrates this is this. There are some differences between uh, try-catch used in uh, traditional programming languages like Java, or C sharp versus Swift. You start handling this by call, by using a loop called do try catch. Okay, do within a loop say try a function, any function that has the throws clause annotated in the function uh, declaration has to be uh, written with a try condition try clause. Okay, the syntax. Try, do try something, catch error, that's all. In this case, uh, NSJS on serialization, uh, when it encounters an error, it previously returned uh, NS error pointer, right? It doesn't anymore. With Swift 2, it just throws an error, okay? The differ statement is very similar to finally which means this statement will be executed regardless of whether this function throws an error or not. It's usually used for closing resources or uh, if you're listening to an NS notification, you want to stop listening, doing all the stuff, you, 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 you do the cleanup stuff in defer, okay? So because now do keyword is used for try catch, the do while is changed to repeat while, okay? So what is the difference? There is no matching, you have to handle every error case. Like in Java, exception handling is kind of abused by most developers. They just do try catch exception e, e dot print stack trace, right? This is, this is a very common pattern you see in most Java code. Try catch exception, the whole of any exception, and then, then just print e dot print stack trace, right? You cannot do that with Swift because you, you, there is no matching. You cannot do a global match for any condition. You'll have to catch one by one. And if you're catching one, you'll have to catch everything. Okay. Uh, also, I don't know why it's, this is the case. There's no way to specify what kind of errors a function throws. There's only one class called throws, that's all. 
you cannot specify what it throws. Something is missing. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it is by design or if this might change in future. It's still new. You might see some changes here in Swift 2.1 or something. Testability, uh, as I explained, there's a new annotation. If you use this annotation and import a class, uh, you can start testing all the internal and private methods of that class. Filability checking, yeah. This is the code that you can use to see if a particular, like previously, availability checking was complicated. You, you do something like, if a particular function was available, then call that function, right? Uh, that's all fine. The problem with that uh, technique is the function names are all written in strings. And because of that, you were able to call private APIs. We used to do that name mangling just so that I can use a private API, right? This new availability checking, you cannot call a private API anyway. You cannot create selectors from strings, arbitrary selectors from strings and call it. Okay? This is actually a, a bad way to do availability checking, but I don't know why Apple is recommending this over the previous uh, selector way or previously checking if a class is present and then instantiating or something like that. You might expect changes. You can expect changes in this. Okay. Uh, you can also use, instead of if available, you can use God available else return. So if it is not iOS 9, you can, you can, you can just do an early return using the God statement. Okay. That's a brief introduction to what is new in Swift. The most important take back is start using Swift. Okay, because Swift 2 is much more stable. Uh, Xcode 6 crashes a lot when you're writing a Swift uh, application. <laughs> the most common crash was source kit service terminated and your code becomes black and white. You'll not see any source code formatting you cannot compile anymore. You, you, you won't get uh, suggestions, autocomplete suggestions, anything, till you restart Xcode. This was super painful when uh, we started learning Swift last year. Okay? With uh, the latest release of Xcode 6, which is Xcode 6. Point, I don't know the number. Uh, it was released in uh, April along with Swift 1.2. That fixed most of these problems. And with Swift 2, I still get crashes, but very, very rarely. Okay, and uh, because now you have a migrator, you can you can be happy. You can you can be uh, assured that your code is not going to be wasted when Apple releases a new uh, Swift compiler and Swift uh, language feature. There'll always be a migrator that helps migrate your application to the to the latest one. The reason why I'm uh, asking you to adopt Swift is next year you will have features that can be used only through Swift. Maybe. Okay. Maybe when Apple releases a TV, they'll say only Swift uh, binaries can be deployed to an Apple TV. They can do it. So you, you, you will be like, what? That's all. Okay. That also means if your company you're working for is using Objective-C and have no plans to adopt Swift, you're going to be out of job in a couple of years. So you know what to do now, right? Start learning Swift and start using Swift at least by December this year, okay? In, when, I, when I say December, it's already going to be like I was 9.1, 9.2 and above. Many, many open source libraries will, will, will be available for Swift by then. Okay, and if if you're still using Objective C, it's like going to be dated. Okay, I was actually expecting a slower adoption for curve for Swift. Like back in 2000s, when Microsoft uh, was use, was still using VB and um, C++ and all this stuff, they migrated to C sharp, right? And that adoption curve was like since 2001 they started, and then by around 2007. Almost everyone was using C Sharp, right? It took six, seven years for Microsoft to move all developers over to the new programming language. But for Apple, it seems like it's going to take three to four years 
and to, this is the second year. So th by, by next year, almost like 50-60% of developers will be using Swift. In fact, uh, this year's WWDC, almost every single uh, source code demo that Apple has uploaded are all in Swift, 90%. But previous year, the WWDC 2014, when Swift was introduced, not even one single application, one single demo app was in Swift. Because Apple know that they are going to change. So they did not invest time creating those applications that are going to be wasted, right? But not anymore. It's becoming a, a very important language. And Swift is getting open sourced soon. Not yet, but soon. Uh, when it is open sourced, you will even see Swift being used on servers just like Golang or something. Okay, there'll be new runtime compiler, runtime interpreters and compilers target uh, that lets you use Swift in other completely different platforms, including Android. Okay? All these cross-platform tool developers, like you know, those who've been using uh, cross-platform tools to make applications that run on iOS, and all these guys will start making tools that let you compile Swift code for Android and Swift code for Windows Phone. Okay? I mean, this can happen probably in a couple of years' time, but yeah, it's eventually going to happen. Uh, which means you cannot ignore Swift anymore. It's a very important language. Start learning it. Uh, the, ad the advantage of being an early mover is that you'll know much better, uh, you'll, you'll have much better understanding with Swift five years from now, if you start learning now learning today. Okay. Uh, questions on Swift? Nothing? Okay. The last part of the topic is Xcode 7. Not that important. Not so many changes in Xcode 7 per se. Uh, the most important change with Xcode 7 is the way uh, it does app thinning. App thinning is not just for images. It's for binary as well. When you compile an app today, you have something called valid architectures. You select something called valid architecture and say, I want to support ARM v7, ARM v7s, and ARM64, right? Uh, but with app thinning enabled in Xcode 7, you don't have to choose an architecture. What instead happens is Xcode 7 compiles your application into uh, intermediate code very similar to Java bytecode or C Sharp's uh, common language runtime code, CLR. Okay? And this code gets uploaded to iTunes Connect. The App Store application downloads this, compiles it into the native binary of that phone, uh, which means your application, uh, you don't have to resubmit your application whenever Apple releases a new device your app will just work. Like for example, when uh, Apple introduced 64-bit uh, iPhone, almost 90% of the apps on App Store, on day one of their uh, launch, 90% of the apps were not running on 64-bit processors. They were running on downgraded 32-bit equivalents, right? This problem will not happen with, uh, uh, with the new app thinning. You upload a byte, uh, you upload a bit code, the App Store compiles it to uh, uh, assembly to a binary that runs, the fa uh, that runs the most fastest on that particular device that downloads your app. Bitcode is going to be uh, the <coughs> yeah, with more and more processors like WatchOS has a different processor from my iPhone. So if my app supports iPhone, iPad, and uh, Watch, Apple Watch. I'll be shipping like a fat, fat, fat binary with all these three architectures. ARM v5, uh, sorry, ARM v7, ARM v7s, ARM64. I know what architecture watch uses. Okay? So with Bitcode, you just submit one Bitcode to App Store, so, sorry, to iTunes Connect. iTunes Connect automatically compiles it for you to the respective operating, uh, to the respective platform. Okay? Important thing, 
for watchOS, you can no longer submit ARM v7, ARM v7s, ARM64 binaries. You will have to compile it using Xcode 7 to submit it to App Store. If you want to run your application on your watch. Traditionally, till watch OS 1.0, your applications were not running on the watch, right? Your applications were running on the phone. Used watch as an external screen, right? That's how your watch OS, but with watch OS 2, you can run applications right on your watch using the watch's GPU and CPU. And that requires that you submit your applications as bitcode. On iOS, bitcode is optional. You don't have to submit it, but it is selected by default for all uh, new projects created on Xcode 7. And eventually, Apple is going to say all applications submitted to an App Store from so and so date has to be compiled using compiled to bitcode and then you will have to do it you don't have a choice okay so bitcode is very important it's one of the major tweaks that made uh, uh, made writing uh, made your code platform independent you can write your code today that works on any platforms of uh, any platform of apples okay including any upcoming new platforms that they create. It could be a TV, it could be a, a new Mac that runs iOS applications or whatever. So what is there in future? 10, Swift 3, and Xcode 8. I'm expecting some new things to happen around ATS, App Transport Security, because HTTP 2.0 or HTTP 2, they don't want to call it as 2.0. They just want to call it as 2, because it's not a version number. Uh, HTTP 2 mandates that every website uh, uses secure transport layer SSL by default. And that means ATS will have some changes, uh, possibly mandating that you can no longer create an NS URL session with HTTP colon slash slash uh, protocol at all. App thinning, you will see a lot and lot more changes to app thinning and uh, yeah. Because there's going to be new devices, new platforms, stuff like that. Again, Bitcode, same thing. Swift 3 will become super popular by next year. And Objective-C, the usage of Objective-C will go down. Uh, that doesn't mean Objective-C is going to be dead. We still use C in our iOS applications, right? How many of you have done core text before iOS 7? You use C, right? How many of you have done uh, TCP-based networking, FTP clients or something like that? Core foundation, core core network uses C, right? So you will you will still be using Objective C, but the but the amount of Objective C code that you write in your application will drastically come down. Today it's hundred percent. This year probably you will be using like thirty percent Swift and seventy percent uh, Objective C, but uh, by by next year around this time you'll probably you'll all be using Swift. And two years from now, people will not even know Objective C to that extent. Like today, if you ask anyone uh, if they have written C C plus plus code in their iOS applications, almost like ninety nine percent of developers will say no. You probably did it, right? No. You will see better avail availability checking in future. Newer devices and how Swift uh, lets you adapt your code on all these devices. So watch out for all this uh, over the next few months or years. That's it. Questions? Yeah. Uh, do we have solution for the storyboard merge conflict? Storyboard merge conflict, OK. Uh, with Xcode 6, you probably will not end up with a conflicted storyboard as it used to be. Okay? Uh, the most common conflict happens when two developers are using different versions of Xcode. So when they, use, when they open your in the storyboard file, the storyboard file has something called version number that gets changed every time someone even looks at your storyboard file. That is fixed with the latest release of Xcode 7. 
OK? Uh, the next important stuff uh, that you have to understand is don't create one single storyboard for your entire application. If you do that, then I, uh, I cannot help you. No one can help you, OK? <laughs> I've seen storyboard with like 70 view controllers. Imagine 70 view controllers. It's impossible. There isn't even a search function. You cannot even go to a single view controller. And, and there are, uh, on, on the other end of the spectrum, there are developers who create one storyboard for every single view controller they use. So don't be like that, OK? Your storyboards are like this. For one given use case, you should use one storyboard. OK? Like, for example, uh, an app that shows uh, a splash screen, a landing screen, login, sign up, forgot password, all these screens can be combined together into one storyboard. OK? Your main screen settings and all those stuff that uh, you navigate from your, from your first screen can be in another storyboard. OK? Any activity that the user performs, like for example, if you're making Instagram uh, kind of application, the camera flow can be on a different storyboard. It makes sense in two ways. One, lesser merge conflicts, because someone who is taking care of login-related uh, issues or enhancement features will not be working on your storyboards. You probably will be working on, like assume that there are two developers. One developer is uh, working on camera. The other one is working on login. So if he modifies and commits his login storyboard, you will not be affected. But if all of them are merged into one single storyboard, you're going to be in hot soup. It's going to be problematic. Okay? So break your storyboards into multiple smaller storyboards. Identify use cases, identify the boundaries, and then do it. Okay? The best part. Uh, Xcode 7 doesn't alter your version number inside your storyboard anymore. So you can, you know, previously I used to uh, recommend that all developers should use the same Xcode version, including the minor version. If it is 6.3.2, everyone should be on 6.3.2, otherwise it's going to be messy. This guy opens it in 6.3.1, commits his storyboard, and then the other one cannot uh, open it anymore. Like, there will be merge conflicts inside it, right? This problem will not happen anymore with Xcode 7. It's fixed. Uh, yeah. The only way to avoid storyboard conflicts is by making sure that your storyboards are broken down into multiple sto different storyboards in a way that different developers will be working on different storyboards as well. Does it answer your question? Yes. OK. Any other? Anyone else? Question? Yeah. Yes, yes. You can still target iOS 8 and iOS 7 with Xcode 7. <coughs> the adoption rate for iOS 8 was not significant like the previous releases because iOS 8 was slow. iOS 7 and iOS 8 was slow to run on old devices. But iOS 9, uh, because of the refactoring and performance improvement they did, Apple claims that it can run even on iPad 2 that was released in, what, 2011? That was, it's a four-year-old device, which can still run iOS 9. And what Apple claims is that it's going to be faster than iOS 8. So if it is really faster, people will start, uh, start upgrading their application, uh, sorry, start upgrading to iOS 9. And that also means you don't have to target iOS 9, 8, 7, and so on. It's actually very, very hard to support more than two versions of operating systems on uh, iOS. Because they keep adding too many new features, and all those fancy applications start adopting those features, and your boss wants those features. Right? So it becomes harder. Yeah. Questions? That's all? I'm just on time, 8.55. Last one. Okay, thanks.